right. Thank you all for coming out tonight for our fourth annual Griggs v. Duke Power Company webinar. Um, this has been a wonderful series. Uh, last year was my first year as part of the MARC, doing this covering um, rural education in Rockingham County. Um, this year, we were um, fortunate enough to have Professor Delmont from Dartmouth Uni uh, College be part of this as we we're focusing on World War II veterans uh, and the African American experience there. Um, with Valencia's going to correct me because she's changed the number on me a couple times. <laughs> um, I think we're up to what, 12? 12. 12 uh, of the 13, 14 plaintiffs were after World War II veterans. Um, and so we're here tonight to talk about them, try to get some more context what their experience was like before I handed off to Valencia. Uh, I do have to thank Duke Energy. They've been a great sponsor and helping us with some grant funding to do programs like this and have been really interested and invested in us developing our overall project with Griggs v. Duke Power Company. Um, and I'm also excited to announce tonight the um, we've had a donor who's been associated with the museum since it opened in 2012 come to us and create the Harold and Lula Bass Endowment, which is an endowment that will look at um, us acquiring and preserving artifacts of uh, peoples of African descent in Rockingham County, as well as displaying and doing programs like this for um, all peoples of African descent. Um, we do have early history of enslavement and Rockingham County does have some history from the Caribbean, so we're trying to be as inclusive. Um, so if you'd like to help support Greg's be the power moving forward or anything involving people of African descent, uh, reach out to the mark and we can tell you how to uh, make contributions to that endowment fund. And with that, I'm going to turn my screen off and hand it over to Valencia. Good evening, everyone. I am happy to be here once again um, with the Griggs, the anniversary date of the Supreme Court decision of Griggs versus Duke Power. 1971 case. Uh, I am honored to not only share this space um, with the wonderful executive director, um, but the students as well, our special guest, and uh, Professor Delmar. I am thrilled to be here, um, mainly because this is history we're introducing to the public for the first time. So I'm going to save that for a little bit later. Um, but I do want to start by acknowledging why we're here and how we got here, um, especially with my students. Um, this is part of the National Council for History Education. I have been really blessed to be able to do it for two years, and I also got approved for year three uh, with this. Um, the rural experience uh, is looking at those communities um, that usually don't get um, their voices amplified. So we're doing this uh, through them and through this grant, we were able to research for six months um, to dive deep into the history. We still have a lot more to go, but I, again, cannot say enough with this opportunity, not only for the community of Rockingham County, um, but for what it brought my students over the last two years um, with this. Also, I want to give a shout out to uh, the North Carolina Humanities. Um, the History Club, uh, which these students uh, come from in regards to the project. We're doing this for the first time, North Carolina Reads, and the book for March is Poster Girls. And I think that that is great conversations to have with the book Half American. Um, so we invite you to join us this month. Um, you can just Google North Carolina Reads um, the discussions are virtual and free and online um, as we dive deep into um, World War II. The other announcement um, that 
I want to make is that um, because of Zen Education Project, they are wonderful, absolutely wonderful. They introduced me to this book. And um, as I've said to my students at the beginning, before I read this book, I, I would tell my students, I don't particularly like military history. I, I own it. I was like, I don't. And after reading this book, I can't say that anymore. I'm not going to say that I like it, but I understand more the nuance and why I should not only be learning it for myself, but also my ability to teach history, not just American history, but to teach history that I need to embrace that military history uh, as well. So um, because of that book, it definitely changed my perspective. And through Zen Education Project, um, they gave classroom sets of books, and I definitely signed up. So any student that's on from Rockingham County um, that's on this uh, program tonight, if you would identify which school you're at, you will receive a copy of the book, Half American. And I am so happy to share uh, this um, book um, with you. And then the last announcement um, that I have is that through the director, CJ Idol, uh, Mark is beginning a, a nonfiction community read. Our first read will be Half American. Um, it will be a nine month, mm -hmm. nine month, um, discussion. So we're starting in April, ending in November, and we're meeting once a month. Uh, it will be four in persons, four virtual, and one hybrid. Um, so our first um, meeting of that book will be on April 25th at Wright Tavern. So if you can't get enough of this book, and I'm sure after this program, that is going to be the case, then join us over the next couple of months um, as we not only look at this uh, story of half American, but also how does it apply um, to the people um, in, in our community. Um, so I am looking forward to that. I'm gonna hop back in real fast. Um, I forgot to mention, thank the Rockingham County Tourism and Economic Development Offices, they are hosting us tonight. So if you see us looking over our shoulders, we're actually looking at each other because we're in a big conference room, but we're, we're trying to disguise that a little bit because the actual museum and archives is undergoing a major HVAC renovation and is not habitable at the moment. Um, and I just wanted to point that out because we, we've kind of awkwardly looked at each other a couple of times and I noticed that um, and thank you. And for that first meeting, you don't have to read the whole book. You don't have to read any of the book. We're just going to kind of go over some basic pointers and get people um, in the right mindset of how to read the book and pull out some themes that uh, Professor Delmont will probably identify for us tonight. So, um, And I will say I've read the book cover to cover, and I am looking forward to uh, dissecting it even more. So, And again, this is from a person who says, that they don't like military history. So just to put that out there. Um, and as any teacher knows, you, you don't do this job alone. And there's no way that all of this could come about if it wasn't for the people um, in this community that has supported my nerdum as I dig deep into uh, Black history uh, for Rockingham County. Um, I am just in awe every time that I put an ask out there um, that I get a yes. Everything from Professor Delmont saying yes uh, to our guest speakers that we're gonna hear from uh, in a moment. I'm just in awe and just grateful. Um, but also some other people that's not in the room, James Library for um, providing the opportunity for them to do research with items. As we tell my students, not everything is on the computer. They don't believe me most of the time, but the James Library shows that. Uh, Rockingham Community College, Rockingham County Foundations, 
and especially my history club, which is the RECHS, Tar Heel Junior Historian Association. Now you know why we just say history club. Um, they are wonderful students and I could not have done any of this um, without that, their assistance. Now I want to um, give space to two special people. Um, is Dr. Brooksy Broom Sturvent, you're on? Okay. I want to start with Dr. Um, Sturvent and then um, John Horan. If um, I'm not going to introduce anymore, so we'll just take it from there. Thank you and hello everyone. I'm super excited to be here. I've worked with Valencia in the past. We were uh, teachers in the same middle school and yes, we signed up for middle school initially. So that definitely tells you a lot about us. Um, at this point, I'm a career educator, also an author. I really love history. I was an English and history teacher um, and Realized that Valencia was doing research. I got intrigued because my family's also done some work um, regarding Duke Energy in the past. So that sparked my interest. And then I noticed that one of the plaintiffs had the surname, same surname as one of my family names. So I was like, hold up, Valencia, what are you researching? Because I'm all into genealogy. Maybe I can help. And sure enough, I was able to link her with some papers through some of my family connections. So it's really been exciting to see all of the progress. And even since then, I started digging into the history all the more and start to put, started to put together a book for our young people so that this history can remain and get in their hands. So um, we're still in the process of developing that, working with illustrators, hoping to have it out soon, um, but really excited to be here tonight to make the connection because we do realize a lot of the plaintiffs were involved with World War II, so I am excited for this insight. Thank you. I guess I'll, I'll introduce myself too. I'm John Horan. Um, I worked with Valencia. I just, I think I sent her a note about uh, a project she was working on. It might have been this project. Uh, because we have at the State Archives, um, I'm the oral historian at the State Archives, and um, at the State Archives we have a project on school integration and desegregation that I started, and 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 this, and I saw what she was doing, and I said, okay, there might be some overlap. So I sent her a note, and then we set up a meeting, and then another meeting, and then she had me out there. Next thing I know, t talking to her class, teaching her class on how to do oral history. Happy to do it. Would do it again. Uh, it was fantastic. We took a tour of the of the mark, and then. Um, you know, then subsequently when we she found out the more connections with the World War II piece, she reached out back to me. I connected her with my the military archivist at the at the State Archives and happy to be in that support role throughout as as I just watch her and her students do this just fabulous work together. Thank you. Um, let me start my video. Okay. Thank you both for being here. Um, both of them are, um, their speech, uh, they have way more to add to that. And I just want to touch on a couple of things. Um, Brooksy, uh, when she first started um, with this, she just came in, as she said, because she just heard the history. She has been so supportive for everything. And one of the things that she created is she's not only a talented author, um, but a gifted poet. And one of the things that she created uh, when we received the uh, two historical markers, yes, I am bragging, our county got two historical markers on this case. She created the most divine historical poem uh, capturing this event. Um, with that. So um, those that was there to hear that, uh, it was an honor. And that poem, and Brooksy can correct me, is going to be the basis of your book. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, so yes, we're going to use the poem, try to bring it to life and make it relevant to our young people again, so that this 
kind of be spread to the next generation and won't get lost. So coming soon. Hopefully I can get the illustrations done. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, but the poem is uh, spectacular. And for John, um, his input into um, the oral history, one, he basically told me I was doing it all wrong teaching my students. <laughs> so um, I have a lot to learn. And one of the things I want to show my students is always go to the experts um, when you're doing things like this. And not that I was out of my comfort zone, it's just that he brought a whole lot more details and gifted my students with a lot of learning and skill set that I could not impart. So um, I am just grateful for that and his continued um, connection um, to Rockingham County because most people don't even know that we exist, even within North Carolina. Uh, so I'm just really grateful for that. And that his skills that created that he has a podcast. So would you speak to that, John? Uh, well. Sure. I, I'm happy to take a plug for a pod, the podcast, but I will say, I, I didn't tell you what you're doing was all wrong. Now, wait a minute now. What <laughs> I, you just asked me to talk and I did, and it was a detail. It was just detail. That's all it was. Anyway, so um, the podcast is called Connecting the Docs because we work at a state archive and we are filled with documents. So it's a nice little pun on dots and docs. And uh, we just finished our fourth season. Um, and I just commend everybody to listen to it. It's terrific. This last season, we emphasized the fact that the state, uh, statewide did a year of the trail. Um, and so we did three episodes on that, including an actual hike where you got to hear us record the podcast in, in the wild, so to speak. Um, and then we also did another series on, on three, uh, three episodes on, uh, processing collections that we had previously processed. So either they needed to be rehoused for whatever reason or digitized as part of a new effort. You know, America 250 is coming up, the 250th anniversary of, of, the, of, of the United States. And so we did, we're doing some digitizing for that. And as we go through these things, we're discovering more things than the finding aid points out. And so we are, we, we then took a couple of highlights, three highlights and, um, put them out there in the podcast. Uh, and one is particularly juicy story of um, uh, uh, John Williams, who you may have heard of him as a composer. There was another John Williams general in the Revolutionary War, and he has a collection in, in, our, in our private collections. And, and uh, in this box, there is troop movements, correspondence to other generals and, and, and people, uh, you know, official things, political stuff. It's, it's, it's interesting, but it's all been documented. It's all in the, in the open. One letter happens to be found. We've happened to find one letter in there um, uh, from a woman to General Williams about her, her daughter that she had with General Nash outside of, of marriage, outside, he's, General Nash is married to somebody else. And, and this, this woman is asking John Williams to take her daughter in because she's dying and Nash is already dead. And you'll have to listen to hear how that pans out. So there you go. That's my cliffhanger plug for Connecting the Docs, State Archives podcast. Happy to plug that anytime. Uh, thanks to both of you and they do know that I will continue to call on them um, during, during this process. Um, so I am getting ready to share my screen. Uh, Audrey, will you put the link to the, uh, in the screen? Okay, thank you. So um, the first part of this program, I have the honor of sharing our research um, that we've done. The title is Two Fronts, World War II Veterans of the, of the Greek Supreme Court Case. That is a slightly 
smaller title than I title my uh, project. The title of my project uh, for this was Coming Home to Jim Crow, um, World War II Veterans of the, the Supreme Court case of Griggs versus Duke Power. But that was just really a lot to put on the flyer um, with that. So it's, it is melted down to these two things, but what is not going to be uh, short-sighted is the information that we're going to share. So before I start with the veterans part, to get everyone up to speed on this Supreme Court case, this is, like I said, 1971. Um, the decision is made. Uh, the decision is made uh, that, and it's a unanimous decision. Um, the plaintiffs win a case. It's employment law. So the facts of the case isn't that glamorous. Um, 13 men sued for the right to be able to apply for jobs anywhere within the, uh, the plant. It was 1966. They were um, segregated to the labor department, and that's all they wanted to do uh, was to do that. The, it takes five years to decide that. So in 1971, they finally get the decision um, to do that. And on um, March 8th, 2021, um, the mark honored um, that Supreme Court decision with our first uh, program um, with that, with this uh, phenomenal case that's under toll for the civil rights movement. Since then, we have looked at different aspects. Um, the following year, we looked at the silent generation, um, looking at the livelihood of, of these men. Last year, in which John became a part of, we looked at uh, education because the education level of these men also affected the case. Of the 14 men, and I'm going to switch between 14 men and 13 men, and let me explain. 13 men are the plaintiffs of the case. 14 men is what started it um, with, the, with the note, which I'm going to get to in a moment. Um, so uh, last year, we looked at the educational level of these men. Only three of them are going to be high school graduate. One of them has only been documented with some college, and then the others have varying degrees. One of the things that I would come to discover during my research is that I noticed and that there were World War II veterans and mainly that came because I visit the grave sites and it was on their tombstone, but it was information that I had never seen anywhere before. There's a, far as I know, there's only two books written about this case and nowhere had it ever been mentioned that they were World War II veterans. And as I continue to research and then with the availability of the NCHE um, to dig all of this out, we would eventually find that there were 12 of these 14 men that are World War II veterans. Also, understanding that the Black veterans that came here provide the basis for the civil rights movement. Most people put the civil rights movement at um, 1955, which is um, the murder of Emmett Till. But if we look at that stretch of history, 1945 is, is the perfect starting place to, to start the contemporary civil rights movement. And for me, it's from 1945 until we get to the case in 1972 in North Carolina. There are several key factors that I'm sure Professor Delmont is going to go over in his um, speech, but I'm not going to touch on those. Um, but I want us to understand the significance of what these men did. So not only are they going to go to the Supreme Court, but the fact that they're World War II veterans 
took this to a different level of understanding for me. Um, the men that were World War II veterans were Junior Blackstock, Eddie Broadnax, Eddie Galloway, Lewis Harrison, John Hatchett, Clarence Jackson, Herman Martin, Robert Jumper, Clarence Purcell, William Purcell, James Tucker, and Jesse C. Martin. And every time that I've given a speech about them, I always call out their names uh, in honor of their history because their story has gone under told or not told at all for so long. So I honor them um, with, this, with their names. So on the screen also in front of you is the actual, it's a copy of the actual note that these 14 men put on the desk of their supervisor, okay? Again, they're not asking for more money. They're not asking for special privilege. All they're asking for is the ability to apply for jobs other than labor department. And the labor department was manual labor. Those was janitorial duties. Those were the duties of taking the coal out of the out of the train. Uh, the Dan River Steam Plant is an energy plant for those um, that are outside of North Carolina. So um, it's an energy plant. So when the train comes in, they're shoveling coal and all sorts of wet weather, just doing manual labor, and that because of the color of their skin, that's where they have to work. Also, Duke Power um, at this time, it, to be employed at Duke Power means that you had one of the best jobs in the county. Absolutely one of the best jobs. But even with that, Black workers are still paid less um, than white workers. But I also want to make that a point because they're going to continue this, even they know that they have, even though they know that they have the best job in the county, especially for a black person, they're still going to risk all of this um, with this case. Um, and uh, every time that I tell the story, I can I get prouder and prouder of of these men, and I have no relations to any of them, other than um, they're. They're from my hometown, but it just makes me so proud um, that they did this. So these men who were World War II veterans, my argument with this case is this case would not have happened if we did not have the makeup of them being World War II veterans. And especially with that number, 12, 12 Black veterans in one place, that is strategic. I mean, it wasn't strategic on the part of Duke Power, but it's strategic on what they're going to do when they find that they're all together, that they're here um, in this place. And one of the things with the um, one of the things with the study in the civil rights movement, a lot of history is told as if it just happened that black people didn't control that situation or have agency in it, but they did. But we're not told those stories about it, and. That's the point. One of the points that I want to make here is that it was strategic um, that they did that. We only have two pictures of the 12 men uh, in uniform. So if we have any of the family members that's on this program, if you would please help us, I would love to have uh, pictures of all of the men in uniform. The two that we have, um, the larger picture is of Robert Jumper, okay? And then the smaller picture um, in the middle to my right, um, the second one um, is Lewis Harrison. 
um, with that. He will serve with his two brothers, okay? Um, and I'm gonna speak about Lewis Hairston in a, a little bit in more in detail. But we have African-Americans that's serving where their story is not told or very select. I also want to bring uh, to the attention of Booker T. Spicely um, and the historical marker that just was placed in Durham. And I want to make a note that this is the first historical marker in North Carolina that has the word Jim Crow in it because it's significant to understand the world that these men came back to um, with that. What I'm gonna give you is gonna be a really quick snapshot of the men. I don't have all of their complete stories, even though my students did try, and we're gonna continue um, to gather information, but we just have a snapshot of, of these men and a lot of spaces to fill, okay? One of the plaintiffs, one of the men uh, is Junior Blackstock. Uh, from the family, uh, I was told he has a third grade education. And if you look at his draft card at the bottom, it says his mark. So somebody actually will write his name. He just puts an X because he cannot write. Um, he's, he's 21 years old and he's married and he's illiterate. And that got me to thinking when he signs this note, he signs his name. So what happened between this and 1966? So diving deep into looking at how World War II empowered and impact, especially Black soldiers um, in education. So he doesn't graduate from school, but he does learn to read and write at a level to be proficient and to provide for his family, which may not have occurred if he didn't join the military. So that was just a really interesting aspect that it never even occurred to me uh, until, start, until I start doing this uh, research. Another one, the next one um, that I want to talk about. One of my students, uh, she's doing her research and she sends me information and she says, um, this person received a silver medal, medal uh, for bravery. And I was like, mm, don't know about that. Um, it was the right name but she didn't have any other points to connect to. So I went diving a little deeper to find out, did Black men receive or Black soldiers receive uh, their medals or their honors uh, for serving? And from the research, it says no African-American was awarded a medal of honor either during World War II or immediately after. And it is going to be when these men are in their 80s and 90s um, that they're going to receive that recognition. And that is such a, a sad commentary on their lives because they put their lives on the line just as everyone else did. So even when a student is giving me information and it's not correct, it's a learning moment, not only for them, but for me as well um, when we're doing this. And one of the things that with my students is, especially with Black history, what are we missing? How can we find those details when we know that they're not documented? How can we get to those truths? 
Um, and it's hard and it's long, um, but it is worth it. Also, to the next step, uh, Doris Miller will receive the Navy Cross, uh, which is the second highest honor in the United States because I was like, I thought he did, and I had to make sure um, um, that um, that information that I remembered was true. Um, the sad thing is that um, he's not going to live very long um, after that. He shot down um, after Pearl Harbor um, when he goes back in um, for duty. Uh, he shot down um, by Japanese planes um, with that, but he did receive that Navy Cross. Another part of studying these men, um, one of the plaintiffs is James Tucker. James Tucker is the eldest of the, of the 14 men. Okay. Um, he enlisted uh, when he's 26, he's also married. So then finding the average age of the soldier for World War II was 26. So that was par par for the course. So those that are joining um, at the early age um, wasn't the norm, but for a 26 year old um, married man to uh, register for the draft and to serve, um, what did that mean for his family um, when he left? M married family, is that immediate family. What was the thought of his wife um, did he have children um, at this time? Those are the questions that we're trying to answer because we want to know their stories. We want to understand why did they choose this? Um, did it give them the best option uh, at that time? And for James Tucker, it will. It will lead him to employment at Duke Power, again, which I said was paid the highest of any, of any organization in Rockingham County um, with that. But still, that must have been a hard decision um, to make. And the last one that I am going to focus on um, is Lewis Harrison. Lewis Harrison is the one that we know the most information about. I had a wonderful student researcher um, to um, dive really deep in, in, into um, the archives and into the information. We know that Lewis Hairston serves somewhere in the South Pacific. We're still looking. Him and his brother um, serve in the South Pacific. I don't know a lot about this, so um, maybe uh, Professor Del Delmont uh, will share this. But what I understand from the research that I've been able to do is that those that served in the South Pacific, South Pacific got a more global view um, of the world and probably came back a little bit more forceful than those that never left the United States because they were open to so many opportunities and so many experiences. And I know, and if anybody's in Rockingham County, when we say Rockingham County is rural, it is rural. Um, there are places here today that does not have sidewalks or stoplights, and you have to drive 15 or 20 minutes to the grocery store. So it is rural. So for them to leave Rockingham County in the 40s and to go uh, to these places that they probably never even dreamed of. What did that experience mean uh, for them and to them? Um, um, one of the books that I um, am researching or reading uh, to get more uh, context um, is this one that's on the screen. I'm not deep into it, but I do want to learn um, how that challenged their understanding of coming back uh, home um, to Jim Crow uh, with that. I'm hoping that I also were able to find more of the uh, veterans that were able to um, 
if specific, if we're able to document more of that. So what did all of this lead to? Um, for me, and I hope for my student researchers, it brought into context the understanding of really what the Civil War was and the impact that Black veterans had on making that change. Um, the One of the things that I would come to find out during this is that Black veterans show up a lot more than I initially knew. Um, the executive director, CJ Idol, is a baseball fan. So during one of our meetings, he tells me, he tells us that Jackie Robinson was a World War II veteran. And as many times as I've read histories about Jackie Robinson, that never clicked. It never even clicked that he's a World War II veteran. Now I understand the context of what everything he did a little bit better. Uh, Magner Evers, also a World War II veteran. Oh my God, I was like, okay, I get it. But for them to serve their country and have to come back to Jim Crow and to be empowered to do that and then to endure all of that, that also happened here at home um, with these uh, 14 men as well, and they provide leadership. But it also opens up a lot of questions. Uh, how did that look for those in Rockingham County? Coming back to a place that most of them, their family had lived here for generations, does it look any different? Were there incidents, injuries, or death of Black veterans in Rockingham County? We don't know. We're, we're going to find out. Did the rule in accustomed settings offer a protection? Coming back to a place where you know everybody, black or white, you know everybody. Did that offer them a protection that maybe the bigger cities didn't? And my big question is what occurred during those two decades to make those men on March 6th put that letter on the desk? What was, what was the, um, the, the point that they was like, we're going to do this. And what started that fire? So again, I am left with more questions than answers, but I always, that's why I love doing uh, research. And I think that is one of the strongest point is that it makes you think. Um, well, that's what I try to tell my students. I hope they uh, listen um, with that. So that was just an overview. Um, we're going to continue to research and uh, continue to share. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Audrey Seiler. I'm a senior at the Early College in Wentworth. And this is my second year working with the NCHE project called Rural Lives. And my plaintiff was Lewis Harrison. <laughs> and I'm just forever honored to be given the opportunity to research this uncovered history. Um, I'm here to introduce Dr. Delmont. And uh, I first wanted to say that whenever we were reading his book, Half American, for our research in this project, it really prepared me for what I should be looking for in my research in this very narrow field of what we were looking at. Um, and it prepared me to look at history with a lens that sought out connections. Because I read um, Dr. Delmont's chapter on the Navy messmen who protested against their terrible conditions. And they protested in a way that was almost identical to the Griggs case. And so being able to notice that and wonder if that, if since that was published in a major black newspaper, if those plaintiffs saw that and took inspiration from other veterans who have protested before them against their harsh conditions, even though they had already returned home and were protesting against the workforce. Um, I think that making these fact-based assumptions really helped me because black history isn't 
very well preserved. And so being able to look at a whole bunch of different sources and say, well, this said this and this said that and being able to make a point out of it with these little fragments that you have is something that really came in handy whenever I was researching personally. So really how the small moments can interconnect to form the basis of major historical events was something that I really valued that I learned from Dr. Dunlop's books. Um, his work impacted my research in a very significant way, clearly, um, and we're incredibly grateful that he has decided to join us on this program and this public presentation. So Matthew F. Delmont is the Sherman Fairchild Distinguished Professor of History at Dartmouth College, a Guggenheim Fellow and expert on African American history, as well as the history of civil rights. He is the author of five books, including most recently, Half American, the Epic Story of African Americans Fighting World War II at Home and Abroad, which was awarded the Annisfield Wolf Book Award in 2023. His work has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and NPR. Originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota, Delma earned his BA from Harvard University and his MA from Brown University. Once again, a huge thank you to Dr. Delmont for joining us on this presentation. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Audrey, thank you so much for the nice introduction. It's so wonderful to hear that the work was helpful for you in your own research. Um, that's exactly what I was hoping for when I when I write uh, history. Um, Valencia, your presentation was amazing. Um, I've learned so much already from the work that you and your students are doing. And so I just can't say um, uh, how, how pleased I am to be part of the presentation tonight and um, how inspired I am by the work that's going on in Rockingham County. Um, I also want to give a shout out to John Horan, um, who I didn't know was going to be on the program, but I know from our days back at Arizona State University when he was a grad student there and I was a professor at ASU. Um, so give me one second to pull up my slides, please. All right. Um, so if you remember one thing from the presentation this evening, what I'd ask you to remember is that you can't understand American history without understanding African American history. Um, I know it's not February anymore, so we're not in Black History Month, but for me, Black History Month goes all year round. Um, so I'd ask you to remember that we can't understand American history without understanding African American history. Um, I want to start by telling you a bit about where the book Half American came from. So it actually grew out of my last book project, which was a digital book project called Black Quotidian, Everyday History in African American Newspapers. And this was a digital only project published by Stanford University Press, and it's available for free online. I dropped the website in the, in the chat, it's blackquotidian.org. But the idea of this project was to really look at black history across the entire year. So the historian Carter G. Woodson started what we now call Black History Month back in 1926. Initially, it was Negro History Week. And he said all the way back then that the goal of Negro History Week was to create Negro History Year. And so Black Quotidian tried to take that idea seriously, tried to, try to um, post for one day each year um, one historical newspaper article from a Black newspaper. So in the course of that research, I was looking at papers like the Chicago Defender, Pittsburgh Courier, to try to get a sense of how Black communities were understanding history as it was unfolding. When I looked at newspapers from the war years from during the 1940s, I kept coming across pictures and stories that looked like this. This is from the Minneapolis Spokesman, which is the largest and longest running Black newspaper in Minneapolis. Uh, Minneapolis is my hometown, so I want to give a shout out to Minnesota. First, I came across dozens and eventually hundreds of these pictures and stories. And these weren't famous Black Americans. These were average Black people from North Carolina, from Minnesota, from Boston, from Chicago, from Los Angeles. Um, some of the more than a million Black men and women who served the country during World War II. And I was surprised about how many examples I saw. Uh, I'm a teacher also. I've taught about this topic in the classroom for more than a decade, but I'd never seen this many examples of Black Americans in the service of their country during World War II. And so it was really those newspaper articles that made me curious. I wanted to know what more there was to the story. What wasn't in our history textbooks? What, what was I not teaching my students about Black Americans in the war? And so it was about seven years ago that I was finishing that last project, and it was really that curiosity that led me to do the research that resulted in Half American. One of the things I came across in doing that research in Black newspapers was a letter written by a man named James G. Thompson. James Thompson was a 26-year-old from Wichita, Kansas, and in late December 1941, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, he writes an amazing letter to the Pittsburgh Courier, which was the nation's largest and most influential Black newspaper. Thompson's letter asked a series of very pressing and pointed questions. He asked in part, should I sacrifice my life to live half American? Is the America I know worth defending? And that phrase, should I sacrifice my life to live half American, it really stuck with me. It's why I chose half American as the title of the book. What Thompson was asking is what did it mean to be asked to fight for, potentially die for a country that treated you as a second-class citizen? 
Now, the great historian Stephen Ambrose has said that the great irony of World War II is that you had the world's largest democracy in the United States fighting against the world's worst racist, Adolf Hitler, with the segregated army. Many women like James Thompson recognized that irony at the time. It didn't take historians like myself to come around decades later to point out the hypocrisy of it. They understood that hypocrisy in the 1940s. They understood how deeply unfair it was to be asked to fight for freedom and democracy abroad when you didn't have that same freedom and democracy at home. The Pittsburgh Courier used Thompson's letter to launch what they called the double victory campaign. And that became the rallying cry for black Americans during the war. What Double V stood for was victory over fascism abroad and victory over racism at home. And it's important to understand that wasn't just a clever slogan or rhetorical device. It truly was a two-front battle for African-Americans during World War II. They were absolutely committed to military victory, but they also understood that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to defeat the Nazis on battlefields in Europe and then come home to the same kind of racial discrimination and white supremacy here in the United States. And so they knew that they had to defeat racism here in the United States as well. So during the presentation tonight, I want to try to highlight what I think are the three key arguments that Half American makes. The first is that from the Black perspective, we have to start the story before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Traditionally, in U.S. history textbooks, the story of World War II starts on December 7th, 1941. But it turns out that's actually not correct. The story starts many years before that. If you look at Black newspapers from the 1930s, you see extensive coverage of the rise of Hitler in the Nazi regime in Europe. This is from the Norfolk Journal and Guide in April of 1933, making explicit connections between Hitler and the KKK, the terrorist organization that threatened and in some cases murdered Black Americans in the South. Black people were among the first to recognize the really serious threat that Hitler posed because they understood that he was explicitly drawing on American racial policies to help justify his treatment of Jews in Europe. And so Black newspapers covered the theft of Jewish property, the segregation of Jews on train cars, the violence against Jewish communities, and reported on, it, uh, reported on those stories as an urgent matter that Black people and all Americans need to be paying attention to. And so the sense of urgency was much more palpable in Black newspapers and among Black communities than it was in most white newspapers during the 1930s. If you fast forward a couple of years to the Spanish Civil War in 1936, that too galvanizes Black Americans all over the country. The headline here is from the Chicago Defender in 1936, saying that the Second World War has started because Duce, that's Mussolini, and Hitler are aiding the fascists in war-torn Spain. So this is something that average Black Americans all across the country are starting to talk about. They're paying very close attention to the rise of fascism and the importance of fighting against fascism in the 1930s. There's a group of Americans who actually volunteered to go fight in the Spanish Civil War. They were collectively called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. There are about 3,000 Americans in total. Of those, there were 80 Black Americans who volunteered to go fight in Spain. The famous poet and writer Langston Hughes is fascinated by this. He wants to understand what does it mean for these average black people from Alabama, from Chicago, from New York, to uproot their lives, travel to a country they've never even been to before, to fight in that country's civil war. So he became a war correspondent for the Baltimore African American. And now he travels to Spain and he's on the front lines reporting on these black volunteers fighting fascism. One of the people Hughes writes about is a woman named Celeria Key. She was the only black woman to be part of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. She was a nurse. And initially she tried to volunteer for the Red Cross, but they turned her away. They said the color of her skin made it more trouble than it was worth. So instead she volunteered for the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. When Hughes caught up with her, he asked her, why did you volunteer to go to Spain? She was just 23 years old, originally from Akron, Ohio. What Celeria Key said was, it was really two reasons. The first is that she was Catholic. And even though she didn't consider herself particularly political, she thought it was her obligation as a religious person to help people in need. And so when she read about these peasant communities in Spain being bombed by fascists, she knew she had to do something about it. The second reason is that she was working as a nurse in New York alongside a number of Jewish doctors, and they described some of the atrocities that Hitler was perpetrating against Jews in Europe. And so because Hitler was providing troops and supplies to fascists in Spain, it was really seen as a proxy battle for what would emerge as World War II. And so she understood the importance of doing whatever she could to fight fascism because she knew it wasn't going to be confined just to Europe. And so if you can picture it, in 1937, 1938, this is something Black Americans all across the country are talking about. After church, in their homes, in barbershops, they're being, paying very, very close attention to the rise of fascism years before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. 
The important thing that's going on on the home front is the rise of civil rights activism. So in the summer of 1941, A. Philip Randolph, who's one of the most powerful labor leaders at the time, he's the head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, he threatens to bring 100,000 Black Americans to march on Washington, D.C., unless President Roosevelt agrees to desegregate the defense industries. And it's hard to overstate how bold of a call this was at the time. It was called the March on Washington Movement, and no one had ever threatened to organize this many Black people all at the same time. So there were chapters of the March on Washington Movement that formed all over the country. And the threat is serious enough that it really scares the pants off of President Roosevelt in the White House. Through a series of high-stakes negotiations between Randolph and Roosevelt, the president agrees to sign an executive order that, at least on paper, does desegregate the defense industries. It's what helps open up those defense industry jobs to Black workers during the war. Um, and I think even more importantly, it helps to demonstrate Black political power on the eve of World War II. It proves Black Americans all over the country that if they organize and work together, they can help to hold powerful people to account. They can help to force politicians, business owners to pay attention to their demands. Even though that March on Washington is called off in the summer of 1941, it provides the foundation and the blueprint, really, for the March on Washington in 1963. By that point, A. Philip Randolph is really the, the grandfather of the movement, but he's still there. He's the one who provides the architecture of what becomes the March on Washington in 1963. All of that foundation is laid in the months before the start of World War II. So the first argument the book makes that we have to start the story before Pearl Harbor. The second argument is that we have to take the double victory campaign seriously and tell the stories as in an intertwined fashion, to tell the story of civil rights activism on the home front and tell the, the story of African-American military participation. This picks up on something Valencia mentioned during her presentation, but Doris Miller is perhaps the most well-known individual Black American to serve during the war. It's important to understand throughout World War II, the military is racially segregated. In the Navy, Black men can only serve as mess attendants, where their job is to do the cooking and cleaning aboard ships. They essentially wait on white officers. Even though Doris Miller doesn't have any training on the ship's weapons, he performs heroically on D-Day. He was a young mess attendant from Waco, Texas. Once the bombing of Pearl Harbor happens, Miller goes above deck and helps attend to the wounds of his injured shipmates. And then his lieutenant orders him to go to the anti-aircraft gun. Even though he has no training on the gun at all, he goes over there and starts firing at the Japanese planes, potentially hitting and downing several of them. His story resonated powerfully for Black Americans in the weeks after Pearl Harbor because they understand that Miller's demonstrated the kind of bravery and courage that military leaders say that Black Americans don't possess. Between World War I and World War II, military leaders do almost everything they can to push Black Americans out of the military and truly really disparage the intelligence, courage, and bravery of Black Americans generally. They say they don't have what it takes to be good soldiers and sailors. They don't have what it takes to be officers. And so in those weeks after Pearl Harbor, Black people all across the country are pointing to Miller's story and saying, look, if you just give us the opportunity, we have the, the potential to be able to help defend our country. And as Valencia mentioned, Miller was awarded the um, Navy Cross, but that was only after weeks of protests and um, rallying by the NAACP and Black newspaper editors. Initially, the Navy wants to keep Miller's story under wraps. They don't want to make it a public story. But rumors circulate that a Black mess attendant has performed heroically at Pearl Harbor, and it's only through that public pressure that the story is brought nationally and he receives the, the recognition he deserves. One of my favorite things about being a historian is that you learn new things in the course of the research. And so there are many stories in Half American that I didn't know when I started the research seven years ago. One of those is Julia Salisbury. So Doris Miller wasn't the only Black mess attendant at Pearl Harbor. There were dozens of others, including Julia Salisbury. Like Miller, Ellsbury performed heroically on the morning of Pearl Harbor. He was a 20-year-old mess attendant on the USS Oklahoma. But unlike Miller, he lost his life in that battle. He was the first person, Black or white, to be killed from Birmingham, Alabama during World War II. In this picture, the phrase, remember Pearl Harbor, was posted everywhere in Black Birmingham, in, in businesses and homes, in the weeks after Pearl Harbor. So these are the names that Black Americans were talking about after the, the attack. They're talking about Doris Miller, talking about Julius Ellsbury, and talking about how they want to do everything they can to help defend their country. This is the headline of the Chicago Defender in the week after Pearl Harbor. The headline says, Awake, White America, the hour is at hand. The editors wrote, White America must learn now that a Negro in the armed service of his country, in the uniform of his government, must be respected as a defender of democracy. The Chicago Defender went on to profile three young Black Chicagoans who tried to volunteer for military service only to be turned away. There were hundreds of Black Americans who tried to volunteer 
at Navy and Army recruiting bases or stations after Pearl Harbor, but they were turned away. Because at that point, the Army and the Navy didn't yet have enough all-Black units to accommodate their volunteers. And these young Black Chicagoans were just left dumbfounded. They asked, what's wrong with our patriotism that we can't volunteer our lives to help defend our country? So the first thing Black Americans have to do is really fight for the opportunity to fight. It sounds paradoxical, but initially the military doesn't want Black Americans to serve their country. It's something that Black Americans have to fight for the opportunity to, to do. On the civil rights side, two of the key figures the book profiles are Thurgood Marshall and Ella Baker. Thurgood Marshall is, of course, best known as the first Black Supreme Court justice. But during the war, he was the head of the legal division for the NAACP, where he helped to investigate cases of violence against Black troops, particularly those on military bases in the South. So one of the sources I used for the book were hundreds and hundreds of letters that Black soldiers wrote to Thurgood Marshall, and they described some of the horrendous treatment they received on these Southern military bases. They described boarding trains in northern cities in their military uniforms. And then when they would get to Washington, D.C. or other southern cities, they'd have to transfer to the Jim Crow section of the car. They described pulling into these southern towns and having to pull down the shades on the train cars so that white townspeople wouldn't throw rocks at the train cars because they were so upset about the idea of black troops being stationed there. Then they described the kind of violence that they encountered both on base and off base. And I think it's in that context that we need to understand the murder of Booker Spicely in North Carolina. Some of the letters that Thurgood Marshall received were from Camp Butner in North Carolina. So this was truly something that happened at military bases all across the South. Things got so bad that these soldiers were writing and saying they felt like they were actually at war here in the United States while they were training for war abroad. And they said they would feel safer once they deployed to the European theater or the Pacific theater than they felt at home in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, or North Carolina. Elle Baker is perhaps the most important civil rights activist in the 20th century. She's well known, I think, as a grassroots activist in the 1960s, working with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. But during World War II, she was the head of branch membership for the NAACP, and she was wildly successful at her job. To give you a sense of the numbers, in 1940, the NAACP had 350 branches and 50,000 members. By the end of the war, there were 1,000 branches and more than 450,000 members. All those members paid dues, which meant that the NAACP, by the end of the war, had more money to fight larger, more complex civil rights cases, such as voting rights cases and eventually Brown versus Board in 1954. One of Baker's big innovations was that she recognized you didn't have to be a professional class Black person to be a leader. And so she went and organized people all across the country, and she was paying attention to domestic workers and sharecroppers as potential leaders. It was really a, a pioneering innovation at the time. She helped to open up the kind of membership that NAACP had to people who had never considered membership previously. Importantly, she held leadership training workshops all across the country. One of the people who attended those workshops I'll mention later was Rosa Parks in 1945, fully a decade before the Montgomery bus boycott. And so when historians talk about World War II being a turning point for civil rights, part of what we mean is that the infrastructure of civil rights got built out during World War II. Obviously, Black Americans have fought for freedom through the entire time they've been in the United States. But during World War II, the infrastructure and organization became more powerful. You had local people organized all over the country, prepared to fight for voting rights, prepared to fight against school segregation, prepared to fight for workplace treatment, fight against employment discrimination, such as in the Griggs case. I mentioned Langston Hughes earlier. He kept writing during World War II. Um, this poem is one of my favorites to share with students, and so I'll read it here. Um, one of the misconceptions we have about World War II is that it was a time of great national unity, but the reality is it was not. When you look at the evidence, there were intense racial conflicts all over the country during World War II. In 1943 alone, there are more than 240 race riots and racial clashes in big cities and small towns on military bases and um, in, in counties all across, the, all across the country. Two of those were in Beaumont, Texas and in Detroit in the summer of 1943. They prompted Links and Hughes to write this poem. He said, Looky here, America, what you done done. Let things drift until the riots come. Now your policemen, let your mobs run free. I reckon you don't care nothing about me. You tell me that Hitler is a mighty bad man. I guess he took his lessons from the Ku Klux Klan. You tell me Mussolini's got an evil heart. Well, it must have been in Beaumont that he got his start. Because everything that Hitler and Mussolini do, Negroes get the same treatment from you. You Jim Crowed me before Hitler rose to power, and you're still Jim Crowing me right now, this very hour. Yet you say we're fighting for democracy, 
then why don't democracy include me? I ask you this question because I want to know how long I got to fight both Hitler and Jim Crow. One of the reasons I like using this in the classroom so much is I think it perfectly encapsulates what the double victory campaign sounded like in 1943. In just those few stanzas, Hitler, sorry, Hughes makes explicitly clear that Black Americans are fighting both Hitler and Mussolini and also Jim Crow here in the United States. This was the, the palpable reality of what the war felt like for Black Americans during the war. Going back to the military side of the war, uh, D-Day is perhaps the most famous battle during World War II, June 6, 1944. There were about 2,000 Black troops that were part of the D-Day invasion that landed on Omaha Beach um, during D-Day. One of those groups was called the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. So if you look at pictures of the channel crossing and you see these kind of funny shaped um, oval balloons that floated over the ships, those were manned by a Black unit called the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion. The purpose of those hydrogen filled balloons is that they dangled long wires from them that had mines attached to them. And it made it impossible for German planes to drop low enough to strafe the ships that are crossing the channel or to drop low enough to strafe troops that are coming ashore. One of those troops in the 320th performed heroically on D-Day. His name was Waverly Woodson. He was a combat medic. Even though he was wounded as his ship was coming to shore, he set up a medical aid station on the beach and worked 30 hours consecutively tending to the wounds of more than 200 men. It was a remarkable story. One of his commanders actually recommended him for the Medal of Honor, but as Valencia mentioned, no medal, medals of honor were awarded to black troops during the war. But importantly, Waverly Woodson's story was well known among black Americans at the time. It showed up in black newspapers. And so even though they're not getting the credit they deserve by military officials, black Americans understand how important black servicemen and women are to helping win the war. It's important to understand D-Day just stood for day of the invasion. There was still D-Day plus one, D-Day plus two, and it was really the weeks and months after June 6 that turned the tide of the war for the Allies. Black Americans were absolutely vital during this part of the war because they were the backbone of the Allied supply effort. The group I'll highlight here is the Red Ball Express, a truck convoy driven primarily by black truck drivers. They moved 400,000 tons of ammunition, food, and fuel in the weeks and months after D-Day. It's what made it possible for the Allies to move as quickly as they did across France and eventually into Germany. Almost everything the Allies moved to the front passed through the hands of at least one Black American. It literally would have been impossible for the Allies in America to move these supplies without these Black supply troops. And this was recognized at the time. Langston Hughes wasn't the only Black war correspondent. There were about a dozen others, including Ollie Stewart, who worked for the Baltimore African American. He said, although port battalions and work troops are not generally regarded on par with frontline combat troops, it is a matter of record that no group of soldiers in this theater has done more to make possible Allied victory. They liberate no towns, see no flags, drink no champagne, or kiss happy girls. Yet when things become critical, the first cry of high command is, give us more supplies. So I can't emphasize this point strongly enough. One of the things I try to argue in the book is that World War II is not just a battle of strategy and will, it was a battle of supply. If you understand the war from that perspective, the absolutely vital role that Black troops played becomes all the more apparent. A similar thing was true on the home front. There are about a million Black Americans who worked in defense industries, including about 600,000 Black women, so-called Black Rosie Riveters. Four of them are pictured here at a shipbuilding facility in Richmond, California. These were incredibly important jobs for Black women during the war because this kind of factory work was almost entirely off limits to Black women prior to World War II. And so the war did open up uh, a limited window for Black women to enter the labor force in an expanded capacity. One of those war workers was Rosa Parks. She worked as a civilian seamstress at Maxwell Air Base in Montgomery, Alabama. During the war, by 1944, the buses on Montgomery Air Base were integrated. And so what Parks said is that she could sit wherever she wanted to on the base, on these buses. But when she got to the Montgomery city limits and had to transfer to the city bus, then she had to move to the back of the bus. She said that one block transfer felt like going from being a first-class citizen to being a second-class citizen. Her brother Sylvester served in the Pacific Theater, when he came home, he couldn't get a mortgage to buy a home, couldn't get a job, um, and was discriminated against almost everywhere he went in Montgomery. So those two things helped to fuel her resolve to fight for civil rights. And then, as I mentioned earlier, she attended one of these leadership training workshops that Ella Baker ran in 1945. And so that, too, helped to prepare her for the kind of civil rights career that she would eventually have. She later said, I had always been taught that this was America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. 
I felt that it should be actual rather than something that we hear and talk about. The largest unit of black women to serve in the war was the 6th Triple Eight Central Postal Director Battalion under the command of Major Charity Adams. They deployed to England in late 1944, and their job was, was to distribute mail all across the European theater. And that might sound like an easy thing to do, but that was actually incredibly complicated because these units were moving constantly, and you had dozens of men who had common names like John Smith or Mark Adams. So they had to develop systems to be able to get mail to the intended recipients. And everyone after the war said how important mail was for morale. It was this group of Black women that made possible that mail to get delivered and helped to keep up the morale of troops. So as Vunta mentioned in her presentation, during the war, none of the 433 medals of honor that were awarded were awarded to Black troops. Thankfully, in the 1990s, a review was conducted um, at the request of the U.S. Army, and they eventually promoted seven men who had received the Distinguished Service Cross to the Medal of Honor. And I want to highlight three of their stories here. One was Reuben Rivers. He was a 23-year-old tank platoon sergeant from Oklahoma. He fought through combat wounds and led several tank advances against German positions in northeastern France. He fought with the 761st Tank Battalion that was nicknamed the Black Panthers. They fought for 160 days consecutively across four major campaigns, including the Battle of the Bulge. And as a side note, since Valencia mentioned Jackie Robinson, Jackie Robinson was actually attached to the 761st Tank Battalion, although he never deployed. He was actually involved in a, a bus segregation incident um, where he was court-martialed, and he actually could have been shot in the same way that Booker Spicely was, because these buses were sites of incredible um, conflict and, and violence. And so it's... Uh, Thankfully, Jackie Robinson was only court martial and he wasn't, um, wasn't attacked in the way that Booker Spicely was. If I had to vote for the most interesting person to serve in World War II, Edward Allen Carter Jr. would get my vote. He was raised by Black missionary parents in India and China, so he was fluent in Hindi, Mandarin, and German in addition to English. When he was 15, he left home to join the Chinese National Army to fight against Japanese incursions in Shanghai. He was one of the volunteers I mentioned earlier who fought in the Spanish Civil War, and that was all before he turned 21. In the summer of 1941, he volunteered for the Army, and you would think, with that language skill and combat experience, the Army would have a good role to give him. Instead, they assigned him to be a cook in a quartermaster unit, which I think speaks to the illogic of segregation. The military wasn't paying attention to the people power at their disposal, they were paying attention to the colored people's skin and assigning Black troops to more subservient roles. Nevertheless, Carter serves in that capacity until late in the war when the Army is desperate for more frontline combat troops. He answers a call for volunteers. He's one of 5,000 Black men who answer a call for volunteers. And he actually gives up his rank. He goes from being a staff sergeant back to being a private just for the opportunity to be in combat. He's part of an infantry unit that's attached to General Patton's 12th Armored Division. I want to read to you from the commendation to give you a sense of what he did to earn the Medal of Honor. The morning of March 23rd, 1945, near Spire, Germany, the tank upon which Carter was riding received bazooka and small arms fire from a large warehouse across a field. Carter volunteered to lead a three-man patrol to the warehouse. Enemy small arms fire covered the field, killing one mem member of the patrol instantly. This caused Carter to order the other two members of the patrol to return to the covered position and cover him with rifle fire while he proceeded alone to carry out the mission. An enemy machine gun burst wounded Carter three times in the left arm as he continued the advance. Disregarding these wounds, Carter continued the advance by crawling until he was within 30 yards of his objective. The enemy fire became so heavy that Carter took cover behind a bank and remained there for approximately two hours. Eight enemy riflemen approached Carter, apparently to take him prisoner, but Carter popped up and to defend himself, killed six of the enemy soldiers and captured the remaining two. Now, I mentioned earlier he was fluent in German, so he interrogates these two German troops that he's captured as he's leading them back across the field getting valuable intelligence about where the rest of the German troops are stationed, helping to save the lives of men in his unit. It sounds like Hollywood movie stuff, but Carter actually did it. The last person I'll mention here is Vernon Baker. He was the only one still alive to receive the medal in person. Initially, he didn't want to go. He was 77 years old when he got the call from the White House, and he said, I performed these actions five decades ago. You should have honored me then, not now. But eventually, ba Baker did choose to go to the White House to receive the medal. During the war, he was a first lieutenant in the 92nd Infantry. He took out three machine gun positions and led a battalion charge through heavy fire in enemy minefields to help the Allies capture a German mountain stronghold in Italy in April of 1945. One of my favorite quotes in the book comes from Baker. He said, I was an angry young man. We were all angry. We had a job to do, and we did it. 
What I like about the quote is I think it speaks honestly to the sense of frustration and anger that Black troops and veterans felt during that era. They were outraged by what they had to deal with, but nevertheless, they gave everything they could to help America win the war. So I can say definitively, having spent seven years working on this book, that you can't tell the story of World War II without talking about Black Americans, and that America could not have won World War II without the contribution of Black troops. The third and final argument the book makes is that for Black Americans, the war didn't end in 1945. That whole generation of Black veterans came back and they kept fighting the other half of the double victory campaign. They kept fighting for civil rights here in the United States. As one veteran put it, they went from fighting in the European theater of operations to fighting in the Southern theater of operations. To give you a sense of what they're fighting against, this is Mississippi Senator James O. Eastland on the floor of the Senate in the summer of 1945 as the war is coming to conclusion. Eastland said, Negro soldiers have disgraced the flag of their country. The Negro race is an inferior race. I'm proud that the purest form of white blood flows in my veins. I know that the white race is a superior race. It has ruled the world. It has given us civilization. It's responsible for all of the progress on earth. Now, if these words are upsetting today, and they should be, imagine how they sounded to Black veterans who just risked their lives, seeing their buddies killed, fighting for a country that treated them as half American. They were outraged by this. And it's important to understand, Eastland's only in the Senate because Black people in Mississippi can't vote. The population of Mississippi in 1945 is 48% Black, but fewer than 2% of those Black Mississippians are registered to vote because of decades of intentional voter disenfranchisement, poll taxes, in some cases murder to keep Black people away from the polls. And it's also important to see how proudly and openly Eastland shares this racist vitriol. This isn't some isolated crank writing graffiti somewhere or writing a letter to the editor of a newspaper. This is a sitting U.S. senator that feels emboldened to say proudly that he's a white supremacist. I think it's sometimes easy today to talk about racism in the abstract, or white supremacy in the abstract, but there's nothing abstract or hidden about what Eastland was up to. He was in a position of tremendous power, and he felt proud to articulate his belief in white supremacy. Part of the reason that was a problem is that men with views similar to Eastland served on key committees that helped to shape the policies that determined who was going to get resources after the war. So the GI Bill you're probably familiar with, one of the most important pieces of legislation in the 20th century. So it made it possible for a whole generation of white veterans to be able to enter the middle class provided access to low-interest home mortgages, access to college tuition benefits, access to loans to be able to start small businesses. It truly in enabled a whole generation of white veterans to be able to move in the middle class. By and large, Black veterans weren't able to benefit from GI Bill uh, benefits in the same way, and that discrimination was by design. As, as this legislation is going through Congress, they determined that it's going to be distributed at the state and local level rather than at the federal level. And everyone at the time understands what that means. If you do things at the state level in 1945, it means you're deferring to Jim Crow policies. And so that's how it played out in, in practice. To give you a sense of what this sounds like in terms of numbers, in Mississippi, only two of more than 3,000 VA guaranteed home loans issued in 1947 went to black borrowers. And things weren't much better up north. Out of 67,000 mortgages insured by the VA in New York and New Jersey, fewer than 100 went to non-whites. Nationally, by 1950, white veterans had received nearly 98% of VA guaranteed loans. There's a group of economists at Brandeis University that are doing research to try to study the long-term impact of this discrimination on the GI Bill. And what they found is that there's about a $100,000 difference between what white veterans were able to get from World War II benefits, the GI Bill benefits, and what black veterans from World War II were able to get from GI Bill benefits. And so we think about the vast racial wealth gap we have in our country, a large portion of that can be traced back to the GI Bill and the racial discrimination that was written into that policy. One of the hardest chapters of the book for me to write was a chapter called Homecoming that describes the violence that Black veterans encountered when they returned to the, to the United States. I read about a dozen Black veterans who were attacked or murdered in the years after World War II. I highlighted some of their names and pictures here on the screen, and I'll read just two of their stories. Maceo Snipes was an army veteran who was confronted by four KKK members who came, came to his farmhouse the day after he became the first black person to vote in a Democratic primary in Taylor County, Georgia. Snipes was shot and killed by Edward Williamson, who was also a World War II veteran. George Dorsey served in the Pacific and had been home for less than a year when he, his wife Mae Murray, and their friends, Dorothy and Roger Malcolm, were shot 60 times at close range by a white mob in Walton County, Georgia. Dorsey's white landlord, who was implicated in the shooting but never charged, later said, 
Up until George went in the army, he was a good boy. When he came out, they thought they were as good as white people. This violence against veterans was about power, it was about intimidation, and more than anything else, it was about what kind of country America was going to be after the war. And Black Americans all across the country responded to it. One of the first pieces of writing we have from Martin Luther King Jr. is a letter he wrote to an Atlanta newspaper in 1946 when he was just 17 years old. He said, we want and are entitled to the basic rights and opportunities of American citizens. So in much the same way that people expressed outrage in the summer of 2020 about the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Black people across the country were expressing outrage in 1946 and 47 to some of these murders of Black veterans that I've just described. So that's what the Double Victory campaign was about. Black Americans were absolutely committed to helping win the war militarily, but they knew that wasn't enough. They wanted to come home and fight for actual freedom and democracy here in the United States. And so many Black veterans became civil rights leaders, perhaps most famously, Megger Evers. He was part of that Red Ball Express I mentioned earlier. He was just 19 years old when his unit landed on Omaha Beach just days after the D-Day invasion. On his 21st birthday, he led a group of Black veterans who tried to register to vote in Decatur, Mississippi, only to be turned away by a white mob with guns. He later said, I had been in Omaha Beach. All we Black soldiers wanted was to be ordinary citizens. We fought during the war for America, Mississippi included. Now, after the Germans and Japanese hadn't killed us, it looked as though white Mississippians would. Evers, of course, took on increasingly important roles in the NAACP in Mississippi over the course of the 1950s and 60s. He helped to investigate the lynching of Emmett Till in 1955 and kept fighting for voting rights and civil rights until he was assassinated in 1963. He was buried with buried at Arlington National Cemetery with full military honors. There are dozens of other people I could highlight here. I'll highlight just three more. Hosea Williams served in the Army during World War II. He was nearly killed when he tried to drink from a white-only water fountain in Savannah, Georgia, after the war. He went on to co-lead the Southern Christian Leadership Conference alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. W. Johnson Roundtree served in the Women Army Corps during the war. After the war, she used the GI Bill to earn a law degree from Howard University Law School and then opened up a pioneering law firm in Washington, D.C., and won a number of important civil rights cases in the 1950s and 60s. Then Amzie Moore served in the Army. Then he came home to Mississippi and became a key leader in SNCC to fight for voting rights. The last person I'll mention is Robert P. Madison. Robert Madison paused his architectural studies at Howard University to serve as a second lieutenant in the 92nd Infantry during the war, where he earned a Purple Heart in combat in Italy. After the war, he earned architectural degrees from Case Western and Harvard before returning to his hometown of Cleveland to establish a trailblazing architectural firm. One of the sources I used for the book were a series of oral history interviews conducted by the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. One of those interviews was with Mr. Madison. He was in his late 70s. He described going to a bookstore, going to the big wall of books in World War II, and taking out a big, thick volume. He said he flipped through it and didn't see anything in there at all about Black Americans. And his quote, which stuck with me, he said, we were a forgotten group of people. I wrote Half American for many women like Robert Madison. And I actually had the opportunity to meet Mr. Madison this past fall in Cleveland when I was there to accept the Annisfield Wolf Book Award. Today, Mr. Madison is 100 years old. Right? It's just remarkable. I try to tell my students this all the time, that this history is not that long ago. Right? It's part of why it's so important for us to reckon honestly with the history of World War II, and part of why it's so important the work that Valencia and her students are doing on the Griggs case, that these histories of World War II and veterans and the lives we lived after the war are ones that can help shape how we understand the present. So for me as a historian, as an author, it's so important to try to share this history as broadly as possible. And so the way Valencia and I were able to connect was through the Zen Education Project. Thanks to resources I have from Dartmouth, I've been able to share more than 14,000 copies of the book with teachers and students all across the country. And so I'm so, so grateful that Valencia took up this opportunity, um, has taken the book, shared it with students, and I think even more importantly, has worked with students to create new original research that helps to contribute to all of our understanding of World War II. And so I'm learning things from Valencia and her students. Um, and so again, so happy to be here tonight and uh, thanks for taking time to listen to the presentation. Thank you so much. And the only thing about virtual is that you really truly cannot hear all the applause that is coming your way, but I can see it in the faces. And I just want to thank you um, for, for that presentation. I am, like I said, I've read the book cover to cover and I was still taking notes of things. I was like, oh, I need to go back and check this and this, this. So, 
Um, we're down to a couple of minutes and there are questions in the chat, but we not we're not gonna be able to get to them. And for, for those, I am so so sorry, but I will tell them read the book. But I do want to um share one comment um because I want to be respectful of time. Um and this is from Esther Coleman. Um, she says, Dr. Delmont, I am so deeply appreciative of this presentation. You have filled in some of the blanks uh, for me and my dad's history and therefore mine and my children's and my grandchildren. And earlier she had posted, let me get to it. Uh -huh. Yes, um, she says that Executive Order 9881 desegregated the armed forces was signed by Truman. Um, the Her father was part of the Randolph Coalition and um, she was just asking, could you say more about the politics that pre pre prevented um, Randolph from um, going forth with that? So that, that'll be the only one that we have time for. I am so sorry. Uh, thanks so much for the question. Thanks everyone for um, for all the engagement in, in the chat. I'm sorry, I don't have time to answer more of the questions. So that's a really a great question. So let me address kind of both pieces of it. So uh, 1948 executive order signed by President Truman, um, really important moment because it is the first federal office to become desegregated. Uh, it's really a landmark moment in terms of civil rights history. Uh, the military doesn't desegregate overnight. Um, but by the end of the Korean War in 1953, almost every unit in the military is, is racially integrated. It helps to, in, uh, helps to influence the decision that the judges make in the Brown versus Board case in 1954. And it really sets the military on a forward-looking trajectory with regards to racial equity, um, which is not to say that things are perfect in the military, but they're working earlier and harder than a lot of other organizations are to try to really take advantage of the, the people power at their disposal. Um, part of what forces... President Truman to sign that executive order is the same kind of black political power that Randolph was bringing before the war. And so Randolph never stops fighting for some of these issues. He's right back in President Truman's face um, at the end of the war in 1945, demanding that the military become integrated. Um, part of what changes is that Truman starts to recognize how important black voters are going to be to the future of the Democratic Party. And so there's really, a, it's a political calculus that, that Truman has to make. He's willing to uh, give up the South and he, he loses the South that the Southern Democrats break off and form the Dixiecrats. He loses the South, but he gains black political support that stays with the Democratic Party for years. On the military side, part of what lays the foundation for it is black troops perform really well in World War II. And so even racist military commanders recognize racism doesn't serve the mission of the military. And so they're willing to put prejudice aside to focus on making the military a more effective fighting force. To go back to the part of um, Randolph and why he agrees to call off that march in summer of 41, um, part of it is he he was able to negotiate for everything he could from, from Roosevelt. Um, he's getting pushed back um, in arguments that he's affiliated with the Communist Party and there's sort of red baiting that's already happening that um, threatens to undermine his larger, larger effort with the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. And so Randolph and the movement... Um, it lays a foundation that is kind of pushes the envelope as far as it can in its time period, but then gets undermined by some of the attacks uh, that, that claim he's too radical to be um, to be a national leader for Black Americans. Thank you again, Professor Delmont, and um, for everybody that's on the chat and participating. Thank you for your time and your attention, and I truly wish that we could get to all of the questions. Um, but I will tell you again, read the book, uh, reread the book, reread it with us uh, at the mark uh, starting in April. Um, we would love for you to join us there. So um, as we 